So you've heard many times, you know, Ezekiel warning, Ezekiel message, Ezekiel commission. Better what is the Ezekiel warning to Britain and North America and Northwest European countries? As we analyzed, you might remember the key of David in our series of the Bible studies, the key of David, which was given to the Philadelphia church. We did mention how Israel was punished by God who allowed them to lose their promised land. We went through 20 short lessons, you might remember, on the key of David, that is, on the identity of the house of Israel. And those lessons were written in the 30s of the last century by Herbert Armstrong. Also in his famous book, The United States and Britain in Prophecy, he wrote that the United States, Britain, Canada, and Northwest European nations are among the lost ten tribes of Israel that were taken into captivity by ancient Assyria in 721 BC. And that their punishment would last... 2,520 years or until around 1,800 AD, which means that God didn't give them the promised material blessings and the promised, do promised dominance over the world for 2,520 years. That was their punishment. Now, since then, the prophecies and promises concerning the prosperity and power of the descendants of Joseph have been fulfilled in the English-speaking nations of this world. The Bible prophecy also says that in the last days, knowledge would increase and men would run to and fro. So Bible chronology shows that we are now near the end of 6,000 years of man's history and the Bible shows that Christ will return to rule the earth for 1,000 years. That means that the return of Christ, brethren, is truly near. But it is not yet, because Christ will not return before some major events occur first. These events will have a major impact on the entire world, but most particularly the already mentioned nations of the world, which are so-called lost house of Israel. I say so-called because they're not lost. You cannot have millions of people suddenly just disappear and vanish as if they've never existed before. We do know where the house of Israel is. We've got plenty of proofs and what is now ahead of the house of Israel is the coming great tribulation. You remember certainly that the disciples asked Jesus Christ what would be the sign of his coming and the end of this age. And in Matthew 24, verses 21 and 22, it's a well-known scripture to us. Jesus Christ replied to them, among other things. He says, because the whole chapter is actually his reply. He said, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. And except those days shall be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. For a change, I'm reading from King James Version, just to, you know, spice up a little bit of our understanding and, and, and knowledge, because, you know, even the King James Version can be well understood. So, from these words of Jesus Christ, we see that there will be a time of trouble greater than any time of trouble before, and it would be so bad that unless the days were cut short, no flesh, meaning no humans, no animals, would be saved. In other words, brethren, the tribulation would be so bad that unless God intervened, humankind would destroy itself. Now there is what we read is actually from the New Testament. But we do have, of course, the a parallel verse in the Old Testament that speaks of a day of trouble so great that none is like it. Jeremiah 36. And verse 7, I mention this scripture so often to you, and I hope that you will, brethren, remember it. And every time that you need some key scriptures, as you remember it, you can turn there, and you can start possibly a Bible study from those scriptures, or you can just, uh, you know, take it as corroboration to what you are studying. So Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7 says, Alas, for the dead day is great, so that none is like it. It is even, mark this, the time of Jacob's trouble but he shall be saved out of it. So, you know, they, there cannot be two times of trouble greater than any other time of trouble. So Jesus and Jeremiah are referring to the same tribulation. But in Jeremiah's account, we see that he adds a very, uh, a very important information. Have you noticed that? It's not only the trouble. It is Jacob's trouble. So Jacob is Israel particularly the tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh, as we know from, you might remember from our former studies, Genesis 32, verse 27 and 28, Genesis 48, verses 2 through 5. So, 
Notice what Jacob said about Ephraim and Manasseh in Genesis 48 verse 16. Again, I'm not reading all of those scriptures. You've got references to them. We've got other studies about them. So I'll mention only some scriptures just to remind you. And perhaps you can jot them down and have them in your notes and refer to them later. In Genesis 48 16, this is what Jacob, who was, whose name was changed to Israel, what he said about Ephraim and Manasseh, his grandchildren. He said, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, let my name, my name, that name is Jacob, or name is Israel, let my name be named on them, and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac. That is why, if you, if you remember from our studies, that's how we inferred the Anglo-Saxon Isaac's sons, remember Anglo-Saxon people. Anyway, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. So, you know, when the Bible says Jacob's trouble, as we've just read in Jeremiah 30, it is referring to the trouble of Ephraim and Manasseh in the end time, just before the return of Jesus Christ. And in course of our studies of the identity of modern Israel, we have provided all the proofs that you have there in English, of course, and we have it in written form as well. One of these days I need to compile those writings into one document. So we have provided all the proofs that Ephraim is Great Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and that Manasseh is the United States. And I'll just add for the benefits of, uh, of, of former knowledge or former situations, the South Africa also belongs to Ephraim, even though nowadays it's dominated by the Gentile, Gentile people, but it used to be basically Ephraimite country. So, with all the proofs that we have, we understand that Jacob's trouble, again, is primarily referring to Ephraim and Manasseh, to the Anglo-Saxon peoples of the world, to North America, and Australia, and New Zealand, and British Isles. Now, Old Testament prophecies also indicate that at the time of the end, when Christ returns to set up his kingdom on the earth, all Israel, the ten tribes, as well as the Jews, will be gathered back to their original land that God gave them, when they came out of Egypt. You might remember that I gave you that important message, the second exodus, the soon coming second exodus. And it is so important to understand. It is one of the vital uh, doctrines in the Bible that we need to understand. If you don't have sufficient understanding, I've got written notes, we've got it recorded. So please, please make sure that you get acquainted with that important doctrine. So the descriptions of this return to the land of Israel, so they'll return from their captivity, okay? They'll return. They will not return after captivity in the Great Tribulation. The lost Israel is not the survivor. Surviving Israelites are not going to be returned to Australia, New Zealand, North America, British Isles, brethren. No, they are going to be returned to their own land. So the descriptions of this return to the land of Israel show us that Israel will be returning from a scattered condition of captivity, not freedom and prosperity. And God will rescue all Israel. We read in Jeremiah 37, it says, but out of the trouble, he will be saved. God is going to save Jacob for out of the trouble, or he will deliver him out of the trouble. So, you know, God will rescue all Israel from the suffering and captivity of the great tribulation that Jesus talks about. Furthermore, these prophecies say that the suffering Israel will be in the scattered condition of captivity to enemy nations because of God's punishment upon them for their sins. Now, God will, you know, first punish the modern house of Israel for its sins, then will rescue and regather the survivors at the time of the return of Jesus Christ. Let us take a look at again now of Jeremiah chapter 30, and we'll go now from verse 2 all the way to verse 11. Jeremiah 30 verse 2. Thus speaks the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book, for lo, the days come, says the Lord, that I'll bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I'll cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus says the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now and see whether a man does travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that grace day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. 
For it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I'll break his yoke from off thy neck, and will burst thy bonds. And strangers shall no more serve themselves of him, but they shall serve the Lord their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, says the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I'll save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. For I am with thee, says the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee. But I will correct thee in measure, and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. Well, brethren, this passage directly relates to the Great Tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, which places the time frame just ahead of us, but before the return of Jesus Christ. So the next major, you might say, the, the worst ever time that will happen will be the Great Tribulation. We see that it is God that scatters Israel, and that God does this as a punishment to correct Israel. Yet afterwards, he will save them and bring them back from captivity. Now, we read about this second exodus of Israel also in Ezekiel chapter 39. Let's go to verse 23. Ezekiel 39, verse 23. It says, And the heathen shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity. Because they trespassed against me, therefore hid I my face from them, and gave them into the hand of their enemies, so fell they all by the sword, according to the uncleanness, and according to their unclean words have I done unto them, and hid my face. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, now I'll bring again the I'll bring again the captivity of Jacob, and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel and will be jealous for my holy name. After that they have borne their shame and all their trespasses whereby they have trespassed against me, when they dwelt safely in the land, and none made them afraid. When I have brought them again from the people and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, and I am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations, then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen. But I have gathered them unto their own land and have left none of them any more there neither will i hide my face any more from them for i have poured out my spirit upon the house of israel says the lord god well brethren it clearly says that god will send them into captivity for their unfaithfulness as a punishment but then will regather them from that captivity at the time when he will pour out his spirit on the house of israel so this is all ahead of us brethren the captivity the rescue and the conversion of the house of israel i hope that you understand that and i hope that you you're grasping that brethren because it is very important this is that is what i've been always emphasizing and saying that there is uh, intrinsic role that god has for Israel in the world to come. So God plans to save the, the entire mankind. God plans to rescue the entire humankind. But anyway, Israel plays the key role there, brethren. Because, you know, and the key role will be, first of all, what is ahead of us, the captivity of Israel, the rescue of Israel, the second exodus, and then the conversion of the house of Israel. So that they will become, finally, the role model for all other nations. It's an amazing Wonderful, simple plan, and we need to be aware of that. And many times I told you that all those who say that the uh, identity of Israel is something racist are just in terrible error, and I, I dare even say that they're actually apostatizing from the truth, because the identity of Israel is one of the key doctrines of the Bible. Unless we understand the identity of Israel, we cannot understand the book, uh, the Word of God, the book that we call the Bible. Now, there are other supporting scriptures that show that at the end time, prior to the return of Christ, all Israel will be into captivity as a punishment from God for their sins. But after they have suffered and been humbled, Christ will rescue them and save them from their enemies and regather them into the promised land and also convert them. Now, I'm just going to give you, we will have time to go into all those scriptures, but I'll just give you the supporting scriptures, that, which are these. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 11 and 12. Also Isaiah chapter 60, verses 10 through 12. Then in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 18, chapter 16, verses 14 through 18. Also chapter 23, verse 5 through 8, chapter 30, verses 15 through 18. 
and then chapter 31 verses 10 through 14 then Jeremiah 46, verse 27 and 28, Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 4 and 5, Ezekiel 28, verses 25 and 26, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 16 through 19, Ezekiel 24, uh, sorry, it's Ezekiel 36 still, uh, verse 24 through 28, and Ezekiel 37, verse 15 through 23, and then finally Ezekiel 39, what we, we have just read, verse 23 through 29. And this only goes to show to all of us how important is this doctrine. Have you, have you numbered how many scriptures are there speaking about the second exodus? And sadly, people do not understand, many of those people don't understand. People in the world think that it's all referring to the house of Judah, when in fact, as we have established already, the uh, primary, primary the message of the book of Ezekiel is to the house of Israel, and, you know, people think it's the house of Judah that is mentioned there. And people think that, you know, it's about Jewish people being gathered into the state of Israel today. No, it has nothing to do with that. The state of Israel, once again, is not the messianic promise. The messianic promise is that all the tribes of Israel will be gathered into their land, brethren. And that new, you know, when they all gather into their land, they'll be all given their own portions of the land. It will be much larger than the current state of Israel. And there will be no enemies anymore that will be troubling the state of Israel. The, the, the coming house of Israel gathered in its own land, being ruled by the resurrected King David. Now, before they all gather together, the question is, why will Israel be punished? And yes, I, I, I do think that you don't have to guess too much. Israel will be punished because God offered them blessings and curses. And they chose what? They chose curses, of course. So that's why we see a, a terrible and swift moral decline in the Anglo-Saxon nations. Because when God established his covenant with ancient Israel after he brought them out of Egyptian slavery, he told them that if they obeyed, they would be blessed, but if they did not obey God's law, they would be cursed and God would punish them with grievous punishments. Israel agreed to the covenant and promised to obey God, and God pronounced, this is in Leviticus 26, and verse 3 to 5, God pronounced the blessings that would come upon Israel for obedience. Leviticus 26, verse 3. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then I will give you rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and your threshing shall reach unto the vintage, and the vintage shall reach unto the sowing time, and ye shall eat your bread to the full, and dwell in your land safely. Well, add to this what God promised in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1 through 6, Deuteronomy 28, verse 1, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed be you in the city and blessed shall you be in the field blessed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy ground and the fruit of thy cattle and increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep blessed shall be thy basket and thy store blessed shall be the thou when thou comest in and blessed shall be thou when you go out well those were the promised blessings but if israel and those promised blessings god had to give to the modern house of israel again because of Abraham's righteousness. God promised to Abraham, I will not give the world dominance and I'm not going to give all these material blessings to you as an individual. I'm going to give it to your descendants. And he was going to give it to, to, to their descendants when they were living in their promised land. But because of their lawlessness, because of all the transgressions they made against their God, God had to punish them by allowing them to go into captivity and to go out of their promised land into the new lands. And then in those new lands, after the punishment of 2,520 years, he then had to fulfill his promise to Abraham because God, God doesn't lie. And therefore, since the beginning of the 19th century, all of a sudden we saw the sudden surge of the two nations to the world the dominance and power, which was the England or the Great Britain and the United States of America. And also we have seen, you know, great advancement in the other countries that are of Israelitish origin in the Northwest Europe. The Benelux, the Scandinavian countries, Denmark and the, uh, the countries of the Benelux. So, 
God fulfilled his promise. He had to. Not because the Northwest European countries are uh, very godly and pious, not because the United States and Britain are very faithful to God, not at all. He had to fulfill his promise because he gave unconditional promise to Abraham that it would be so. And then, you know, Israel, as we know, did not obey. And if Israel did not obey, there will be curses and punishments from God. One punishment already happened, but you see this one, the Great Tribulation is ahead of us. There will be drought and famine. In the years ahead of us, we'll see drought and famine in the lands of Israel, in Britain and America in particular, North America in particular, and in Australia and in New Zealand. Leviticus 26, verse 19 and 20. Now break the power of your uh, the uh, pride of your power, meaning your military power. Your military powers are going to crumble. Yes, I know America says, yeah, we are the mightiest nation on the earth. Well, last night we discussed some of us here. Do you people know what kind of arms are there in Russia? Do you people know what kind of, you know, uh, what kind of weaponry is in Russian hands? I don't think that many Americans even have a clue. Do you, yeah, people in the Britain, I, I remember hearing one lady from Wales, but you know, how can Britain be conquered? We are the strongest military power in Europe. Well, yes, my dear, I'm thinking, yes, you still are, while well, there's still money. Once there'll be drought, once there'll be famine, once there'll be no money, I'll see how great your wonderful military would be. So I'll break the pride of your power, and I'll make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass, and your strength shall be spent in vain. For your land shall not yield her increase, neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. Well, brethren, there will be diseases epidemic, disease epidemics. Something like this COVID-19 going around, but much worse, with the death toll in, in the, the lands of Israel will be, will be much worse. And Israel will be defeated by their enemies, verse 25, and I'll bring a sword upon your sword, the symbol of war, that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant, and when ye are gathered together within your cities, I'll send a pestilence among you, and ye shall be delivered into the hand of enemy. And Deuteronomy 28 gives us a full description of God's curses and punishments for disobedience. These prophecies describe, as I said, drought, famine, disease, conquest by enemy nations, and captivity as a result of disobedience of God's commands. So that is ahead of us. Yes, it did happen in the past, indeed, but there is duality in Bible prophecy. So what happened in the past will happen in the future, but this time it will be even worse. And many of these prophecies have been fulfilled, as I said, at least in part, in the punishments and captivities that came upon first the house of Israel and then also the house of Judah in ancient times. But they are also yet to be fulfilled in our time among the modern descendants of Israel, including the American and British peoples. Well, brethren, God has certainly prospered the English-speaking people you know, these last 200 years, as no nations on earth have ever been prospered before in spite of their sins. And God has done this to fulfill, as I said, the promises he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because of Abraham's faith and obedience and to fulfill the prophecies that the sons of Joseph would become a great nation and a great company of nations. Great company of nations, meaning the commonwealth of nations and one great nation under God, what a wonderful motto, and you Americans, all of you believers there should never, be, should never be ashamed of using that. Yes, you became one great nation under God. It was God's providence, it was God's plan. Nothing wrong about that. That's what God did, God fulfilled those promises, but now we're seeing that He's fulfilling, He's uh, withdrawing actually His blessings now. You know, those promises have been kept. He made a covenant that the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will become one company of nations, British Commonwealth, and one great nation under God, the United States of America. And that he would make those nations dominant over the world, and that he would give them prosperity as no nation has ever been prospered. So, those promises have been kept, and these prophecies have been fulfilled. The prophecies of having those two great entities, a company of nations and a nation. However, God is not obligated now to continue to bless, brethren, those nations in spite of their sins and disobedience. So the curses are about to go into effect once again and more severely than ever. Now God's role for Israel has always been, has always been for Israel to be a model nation that would show the other nations in the whole world how obedience to God's law leads to peace, prosperity and joy. 
you know, this was true from the very beginning. And again, just step step back, you know, one, make one step back, brethren. Why is he going to convert the house of Israel? We read, you know, captivity, rescue or deliverance, and then conversion. He's going to convert them finally after Jesus Christ returns so that they would become finally the role model nation that would be, you know, a model for other nations to follow. So from the very beginning, God had that plan for Israel, but Israel never wanted to, you know, follow that plan. Israel said, yes, we will obey, but, you know, soon afterwards, Israel, and keep in mind the Israel of Old Testament, they were carnal people, because the promises of the Old Testament never involved the Holy Spirit. They were all material, physical blessings, you might say, but the Holy Spirit was not promised. And then you wonder, okay, but why, 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 why Israel, why did Israel ob didn't obey? Why did Israel go backsliding on God? Why did Israel, you know, betray God? Well, because, brethren, the human nature is such. Human mind without the addition of the Holy Spirit cannot obey God. It doesn't want to obey God. Remember what it says in Romans, that the carnal mind is enmity against God. It doesn't want to obey Him. Neither can obey God. So that's why. That's why God, as we read just a few minutes ago, he's going to pour his spirit upon the remaining house of Israel. And then the house of Israel will finally be fulfilling its covenant with God. So from the very beginning, this was the, this was the plan. But Israel never wanted to follow the plan. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Deuteronomy 4, verse 5. Behold, I have taught you, so from the very beginning, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye shall do so in the land whither you go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. So that was the plan. But Israel, ancient Israel, failed to be that role model. And the modern descendants of Israel have also failed to be a positive role model of morality for the rest of the world. You know, today, they are anything but a model of God's way of life. However, God still intends to make the modern descendants of ancient Israel a role model for other nations to follow, an example of the right way of life. So he will make Israel a role model in the beginning of the millennium after Christ returns to this earth and deposes the current ruler of the earth, Satan the devil. And God will convert Israel and give them the, his Holy Spirit and God will use suffering to teach those nations a painful lesson to bring them to repentance so that they can be converted at the beginning of the millennium. Now all of this is contained in the book of Ezekiel and also we know that there is a, there is a function that God gave Ezekiel, position he appointed Ezekiel to be, is to be a watchman. Now, there is responsibility, of course, of a watchman. One of the two main points God's, of God's law is, as you know, to love God with all of your mind. The first one is to love God. The other one is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And you find that in several scriptures, believing or not, even in Leviticus 19.18, in Luke, in all the Gospels, in Luke chapter 10, verse 27, in Matthew 22, verse 36 to 14, Mark chapter 12, verse 29 to 31, and one of the application of this law of love is to warn someone who is headed for disaster, but they don't know it. You might remember Proverbs 24, verses 11 and 12. It says, Deliver those who are drawn toward death and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, Surely we did not know this, does not he who weighs the hearts consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And will he not render each to each man according to his deeds? So, you know, we are, to, we are to rescue those who are heading for disaster. Now, Ezekiel was a prophet sent by God with a message for the house of Israel. We see that very clearly in the book in chapter 2 and chapter 3. Now, God told Ezekiel he was to be a watchman. Go to Ezekiel chapter 3. He was to be a watchman for the house of Israel with a responsibility to warn about a coming disaster. And yes, there are people who would love to say that I keep preaching gloom and doom. Well, I'm not preaching gloom and doom. I'm preaching what the Word of God tells me to preach to you, brethren, and to the rest of the house of Israel. It's not gloom and doom. It is the reality which is coming up. It's, it's, it's approaching very fast. 
It's fast approaching reality. And all that you need to see, take a look, take around. I mean, even us who are not in America. I mean, I've, I've watched the latest debate between the presidential candidates. I have to tell you, I've never seen somebody so blatantly lying to millions of people that he didn't say something which he did say. He said that it was the fracking. Remember, he was against the fracking and stuff. And he lies to the American people. I've never seen such a blatant lie, outright lying. I mean, what kind of moral decadence that is? You have never seen anything worse in the political sphere of America, for example. Not to mention other, uh, other aspects of, of, of life in, in, in the modern Israel. So lie has become so, you know, truth has become so cheap. Every kind of truth, including spiritual truth, has become so cheap that, you know, you have a pres somebody who pretends to be, aspires to be a president of the greatest nation of the world, lying to the audience. And even I, who am not American, even I was able to see that he lied because I've seen his statements otherwise. Amazing, absolutely amazing. So I'm not preaching gloom and doom. I'm just warning the house of Israel of the current conditions and what is lying, what lies ahead. Well, do you think that you know there's any 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 perspective that uh, a country that might have such a president presidential candidate that any any there is any perspective for such a country to continue to live much longer, for any society to continue to survive much longer? Look at the division in your society; it's on the brink of a civil war, it seems. So no, I'm not preaching gloom and doom. I'm preaching what the Bible says to preach. And, you know, and yeah, in spite of all of this primarily Protestant idea of we need to be always positive and, you know, we need to be always happy and giving positive message. Yes, I'm giving a positive message. The positive message is because of the horrible sins against God, the house of Israel is going to be, first of all, you know, captured and into horrible captivity. Then it will be rescued by God. And then finally, the best of all, the house of Israel will become converted, godly people, role model for the rest of the world. What is gloom and doom about that? Nothing. Ezekiel chapter 3. So he was to be a watchman for the house of Israel with a responsibility to warn about coming disaster. Chapter 3 verse 16 through 21. Chapter 3 verse 16. And it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speaks to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn from his wickedness, nor from his or he uh, turn not from his wickedness nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Again, when the righteous man does turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die, because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness will, which he has done shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous... Uh, that the righteous sin not, and he does not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned. Also, thou hast delivered thy soul. Brethren, do you understand how gravely important is the position of a watchman over the house of Israel? And do you understand that that responsibility li lies now, not with Ezekiel, whose message, by the way, well, he was unable to deliver to the ancient house of Israel. Do you understand, brethren, do you comprehend that this heavy responsibility lies on the shoulders of all of us? Of all of us, and I realize that here from South Europe, I realize that and I keep in my love for the house of Israel, I keep warning the house of Israel all the time, even though I'm not living in Israelitish nation. But nevertheless, brethren, how much more is your responsibility for all of you who are listening to this and you're living in those Israelitish nations. So the rest of the book of Ezekiel shows the sins of Israel and the punishment that is to come upon them if they do not repent. But who is to warn them about that punishment? Who is to tell them about their iniquities, brethren? We have just read in chapter 3 of Ezekiel. It is the watchman. Ezekiel was a watchman, but not for the ancient house of Israel. Ezekiel was appointed as a watchman for the modern house of Israel. And he, is, he has been long dead, of course. Which means that his responsibility has been passed on who? On us, brethren, on us. 
I hope that we, I, I, I'm hoping if we haven't already understood that, I, I hope that we will finally come to the grips with that and understand it so fully. Now, Ezekiel was told, you know, when God gave him a warning for Israel, that he was about to punish them for their sins. And he was told if he failed to deliver the warning, Israel would still be punished, but their blood would be on Ezekiel's head. The same with us, brethren. Israel is still going to be punished. But do we want the blood of Israel on our heads? You know, Ezekiel was told he would share the responsibility because he failed to warn Israel. If Israel did not repent, they would die for their sins, but Ezekiel would not be guilty. Furthermore, God extends, go to Ezekiel 33, God extends this principle beyond just Ezekiel or anyone whom God makes a watchman to Israel, but even to a watchman for Israel whom God did not put into the position of watchman. Ezekiel 33 verse 1, Again the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, Speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts, and set him for their watchman, if when he sees the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever hears the sound of the trumpet and takes not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him. But he that takes warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet and the people be not warned, if the sword came and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. Well, brethren, notice in this case, it is not God who makes the person the watchman, but the people. Nevertheless, even though God did not make him the watchman, he is a watchman nevertheless, and God holds him responsible for delivering the warning. In verse 7 through 9, uh, then, you know, you have the repetition. God repeats what was uh, said earlier, that God made Ezekiel a watchman, and he was therefore responsible for delivering the warning God gave him for the people. Now, God gives the warning so that people can repent and escape the, the punishment. But now you may wonder, what about someone who has led a sinful life for a long time? Is it too late for them? Are they going to be punished no matter what they do now because of all the evil they've done in the past? Well, if you take a look, we're in chapter 33, take a look verse 10 and 11. Therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus he speaks, saying, if our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how should we then live? Say unto them, As I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Verse 14. Again, when I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, if he turns from his sin, and do that which is lawful and right, if the wicked restore the pledge, give again that he had robbed, walk in the statutes of life, without committing iniquity, he shall surely live, he shall not die, none of his sins that he has committed shall be mentioned unto him, he has done that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. You see, what a wonderful and merciful God. Yes, the God of the Old Testament, supposedly cruel and harsh, according to misguided nominal Christianity. Well, brethren, what about us? If you love someone, I'm sure that you love America, don't you? I'm sure that I don't love America more than you do. I'm sure you, that you don't love Canada less than I do. I'm sure that you love your nations, brethren. Of course that you love your nations. How can you not? Because they're neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. So, you know, take this very personally, what I'm, 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 I'm preaching today. If you love someone, and I'm sure you love your fellow Americans and fellow Canadians and fellow Australians and fellow New Zealanders, if you love someone and you see that they're headed toward disaster, but you have information that they don't have, information that can, you know, helps them avoid the disaster if they act upon it, you will share that information, wouldn't you? You know, you cannot force, of course, but, you know, don't, don't worry. Don't cram your religion down people's throat because you cannot force someone to believe you or to act upon the information, but you can at least share it. That way, the person you warn has a chance. You know, they might listen and heed the warning, but if they never hear the warning, if they never receive the information, they have no chance to escape, brethren. Can we understand that? And not be afraid 
Yes, I know, they won't listen to you. Yes, Ezekiel was told by God, yes, if I send you to people of foreign tongue, they would listen to you, but I'm sending you to the stubborn house of Israel. They won't be listening to you. I understand, Brendan, they won't be listening to you. I understand they'll ridicule you. They ridicule us here in Europe. In a society which is far more secular than anything you have in your Anglo-Saxon nations. But nevertheless, we are, you know, giving this information even related to the House of Israel, even in Serbian language, so that perhaps some of our kinsmen here will have a chance to escape. Now, again, this does not mean that, you know, you should, again, force or pressure someone who does not want to listen. But, you know, you can answer questions, even tactfully offer information, without trying to push. You can just state the obvious. To my nation, I keep stating all the time over Facebook, Germany is on the rise. Germany will become a superpower. Nobody believed me. For years I preached to them that Great Britain would leave European Union. Nobody, brethren, believed me. And then it happened. And now all of a sudden, many of them are paying close attention to what I have to say about geopolitical events. And I told them, how do I know about those events? I know them because of the Word of God and because of the Bible prophecies. Lately, I've been telling them that they will be, and that they will see with their own eyes, the European army. Shocking. Nobody believes me. But I keep telling them all the time, with your own eyes, you'll be seeing the European army form before your very eyes. And brethren, that is going to happen. And when it does happen, I already told them in advance, when it does happen, you'll ask me, how did you know? And I'll tell you, because I have been preaching to you the Bible prophecies. So you can state the obvious. You don't have to try to, you know, convince somebody. State the obvious. Chaos in your societies, moral decline. Economic uh, hardships, stuff like that, you know. A presidential candidate lying to the nation. What he didn't tell the your American nation also is that he was one of the key personalities that bombed this nation and dropped tons of depleted uranium upon this nation. And my kinsmen, our kinsmen here in Serbia, have been dying from cancer and leukemia in thousands, you know, because of what his administration or the administration he was part of did to this country, by the way. He never told you that, but uh, that's part of our reality here in Serbia. And again, yes, I understand it's a punishment on the Serbian people for their evil ways. I have no, no doubts about that. But I'm just saying, you know, he lied to the American nation about other things. Serbian people have got the punishment which they certainly, perhaps they deserved it, perhaps they didn't deserve it. I don't know, God, God will judge about that. But our reality is that we have to deal with thousands of people dying of cancer and leukemia as a result of the bombing of this country. And yes, we can use that to preach to people about healthy lifestyle. We can use that to, you know, preach the good news to people and tell them how those who committed those crimes will be punished by God and that their nation will be punished in worse, worse than any other nation has ever been punished before. And do you believe that somebody will, do you think that somebody will believe me that America will have the worst downfall than any nation ever had? No, nobody will believe me. But I'll still tell them. And one of these days they'll see it with their own eyes. And then they will know that the prophet was among them. Not the prophet me as a person, but the prophet meaning the Bible teaching was among them. The true word of God was among them. Because the true word of God has never been preached in this nation, brethren, until I began preaching it. So... You don't have to pressure somebody, you know. You can answer questions, you can even tactfully offer information, you can state the obvious without trying to push. If the person wants to learn more, they'll ask. If not, you know, we don't have to pursue the subject any further. And a Christian can support the, again, one more, the ordained ministry of the church who offer the public information to warn the nation. You can support, you can share, you know, you're still there on the internet. All that you do is just click a few buttons. You can share Dr. Thiel's message, you can share mine if you want to. I do it on Twitter all the time, among hundreds of people who are of Israelite origin and those who are not. And those who are willing, brethren, to listen and heed, they may do so. Those who do not, are not forced to. And we, of all the people, have done our duty. We have fulfilled Ezekiel's commission. Because remember how heavy responsibility is upon us. Yes. Do we need to sound the trumpet? Yes, we do. Do we see the disaster coming? Yes, we do. We cannot pretend tomorrow, you know, in the January, say, oh, we didn't know that God, how could we, innocent as we are. No, we are not, brethren. We understand, of all the people, of all Israelites out there, all of you spirit-led Israelites do understand what others do not. 
So it is to give them warning, the Ezekiel warning. Now here we come to the crux of that matter, the Ezekiel warning. You've heard that many times. Okay, let's let's now address that as well. God said Ezekiel specifically, as I said, to the house of Israel. In Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 6, 17, Ezekiel 3, 17, he says, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. And the same instruction you'll find also in Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 2, and Ezekiel chapter 3, and the first four verses. So, we know from the separate histories of Israel and Judah that the house of Israel and the house of Judah are two different houses. And we have all this established that, you know, in various numerous Bible studies. The house of Judah is the Jews, and the house of Israel is the ten tribes, especially Ephraim and Manasseh, which are the English-speaking nations today. Now, Ezekiel was to warn the house of Israel of God's punishments to come if they did not repent of their sins. Now, it could not apply in Ezekiel's day, brethren. This is important. Again, I keep repeating that all the time because it is such an important fact. That, you know, warning could not apply in Ezekiel's day because the vast majority of the house of Israel had already been conquered by their enemies and taken into captivity as punishment from God for their sins. So Ezekiel couldn't go, couldn't find them anymore. He couldn't go among them and deliver them his message. So Ezekiel's warning applied to the house of Judah also. is mentioned a few times in Ezekiel chapter 4 verse 6. Uh, and also in Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 17. But yet, the primary application of the warning is to the house of Israel. And in the book of Ezekiel, the prophecies against Jerusalem, as I mentioned already last Sabbath, apply to the house of Israel because Jerusalem, as the former capital city of all Israel, can represent the house of Israel. We read chapter 4, verses 1 through 16 last Sabbath. So the prophecies given to Ezekiel apply to the modern descendants of the house of Israel, namely the United States, Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and several nations in Northwest Europe who are descended from various tribes of Israel. When I mentioned, I mentioned the, 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 the lands of Benelux, I forgot to mention, very important, key role, one of the greatest nations on the face of the earth is France. The northern France is all, including capital Paris, is they're all descendants of Reuben. The firstborn of Israel as well. It's amazing. What are the sins of Israel? Oh, if I ask you, you can surely name me all the sins of your Anglo-Saxon nation. The book of Ezekiel, however, often describes the sins in general sense as rebellion against God's law, disobedience and wickedness. You can find that, for example, in Ezekiel chapter 5, verse 5 through 7. But we can, you know, we can look at God's laws, the Ten Commandments, and we can compare them with the behavior of Israelitish nations today to see what their sins are. Now, there are some sins, however, that Ezekiel specifically mentions. Very specifically, namely, brethren, he mentions idolatry and the Sabbath breaking. Let's see the example of those specifically mentioned sins. Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 3 and 4. Ezekiel 22, verse 3. Then say, thus says the Lord, the city sheds blood in her own midst, that her time may come, and she makes idols within herself to defile herself. You have become guilty by the blood which you have shed, and have defi defiled yourself with the idols which you have made. You have caused your days to draw near, and have come to the end of your years. Therefore, I have made you a reproach to the nations, and a mockery to all countries. Then, if you continue reading in uh, verse 7, it says, In thee have they set light, by father and mother. In the midst of thee have they dealt by oppression with the stranger. In thee have they vexed the fatherless and the widow. Thou hast despised my holy things and hast profaned my Sabbaths. In thee are men that carry tales to shed blood, and in thee they eat upon the mountains. In the midst of thee they commit lewdness. In thee have they discovered their father's nakedness. In thee have they humbled her that was set apart for pollution. And one has committed abomination with his neighbor's wife. And another has lewdly defiled his daughter-in-law. And another in thee has humbled his sister, his father's daughter. In thee have they, have they taken gifts to shed blood. Thou hast taken usury and increase, and thou hast greedily gained of thy neighbors by extortion, and hast forgotten me, says the Lord God. Behold, therefore, I have smitten mine hand at thy dishonest gain 
which thou hast made and at thy blood which has been in the midst of thee we have read now verses 7 through 13 so we have read those specific sins mentioned in the book of ezekiel let's see another example chapter 20 verse 39 as for you o house of israel thus says the lord god go you serve ye everyone his idols and hereafter also, if you will not hearken unto me, but pollute ye may my holy name no more with your gifts and with your idols. Of course, alluding to all those pagan holidays, including the most satanic one coming up, holiday uh, called Halloween. And then if you continue, you were in Ezekiel chapter 22, if you continue from 23 to 29, you can... Uh, you can read that, you know, the Lord, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto her, Thou art the land that is not cleansed, nor rained upon in the day of indignation, and so on. And you can also, in chapter 16, verse 17, says, Thou hast also taken thy fair jewels of my gold and of my silver, which I had given thee, and made to thyself images of men, and did commit whoredom with them, and took thy broidered garments, and covered them and thou hast set mine oil and my incense before them and from chapter 16 verse 17 through 21 you read about again idolatry so that's the idolatry of israel sabbath breaking you know all those nations who don't keep the sabbath inevitably are idolatrous nations because you know what is the modern nominal christianity it's idolatrous they worship their pastors they worship the pope the roman pope they worship the uh they worship their rituals, they worship sun god every Sunday, and so on. So what will be Israel's punishment? Well, Ezekiel and other prophets in the Bible have foretold that God will punish Israelitish nations with drought, famine, disease epidemics, and death from war. We have already read that. Now, they'll be defeated by their enemies, invaded and conquered, taken captive, and scattered among the nations. The vast majority, brethren, will die in the famine, disease, warfare, and captivity. And that's why we have to warn them while we still have time. Ezekiel chapter 6 verse 1. Ezekiel 6 verse 1 speaks of this coming disaster. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face toward the mountains of Israel, and prophesy against them, and say, Ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God to the mountains, and to the hills, to the rivers, and to the valleys. Behold, I, even I, will bring a sword upon you, and I'll destroy your high places, and your altars shall be desolate, and your images shall be broken, and I'll cast down your slain men before your idols. And I'll lay the dead carcasses of the children of Israel before their idols, and I'll scatter your bones round about your altars. In all your dwelling places the cities shall be laid waste, and the high places shall be desolate, that your altars may be laid waste and made desolate, and your idols may be broken and cease, and your images may be cut down, and your works may be abolished, and the slain shall fall in the midst of you, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Verse 11, Thus says the Lord God, Smite with thine hand, and stamp with thy foot, and say, Alas! For all the evil abominations of the house of Israel, for they shall fall by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. He that is far off shall die of the pestilence, and he that is near shall fall by the sword. And he that remains and is besieged shall die by the famine. Thus I will accomplish my fury upon them. And then to add to all of that in chapter 22 verse 15, it says, I'll scatter you among the nations, disperse you throughout the countries, and remove your filthiness completely from you now the prophecies of ezekiel tell us that one-third of the anglo-saxon population will die in famine and disease epidemics one-third will die in war and one-third will be taken captive by enemy nations and many will die in captivity in chapter 5 very often i refer to those two chapters 5 and 6 in chapter 5 verse 12 it's one of those verses that you all, brethren, should also remember, if possible. It says, One third of you shall die of the pestilence and be consumed with famine in your midst. And one third shall fall by the sword all around you. And I'll scatter another third to all the winds. And I'll draw out a sword after them. And how many will be left in the end? Well, according to the book of Amos, chapter 5, one tenth will survive, as I mentioned to you many times. Book of Amos, chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. Hear this word which I take up against you, a lamentation, O house of Israel. 
The virgin of Israel has fallen. She will rise no more. She lies forsaken on her land. There is no one to raise her up. For thus says the Lord God, The city that goes out by a thousand shall have a hundred left, and that which goes by a hundred shall have ten left to the house of Israel. Amos 5, verses 1 through 3, brethren. Another indication that only one-tenth of Israel, one-tenth of the Great Britain and the United States will survive. In the book of Ezekiel, we also find warnings for other nations in the world. We also find warnings directed toward the ministry. Remember the bad shepherds of Israel, Ezekiel 34. The ministers who have not properly instructed and cared for their flocks. Not all the warnings about the sins of Israel and the world are in the book of Ezekiel, of course, but many can be found in other prophetic books in the Bible. However, brethren, the book of Ezekiel outlines and lays out basic principles about the sins of the world, the sins of Israel and the ministry and the punishments coming from God for these sins and also the responsibility to warn those who need to repent and are about to be punished. It also says the principle that those who have done evil can be forgiven if they repent and turn from the evil they have done and learn to do good. Now, Herbert Armstrong has taught that we have the responsibility to deliver the Ezekiel warning message to the descendants of Israel today. And I wholeheartedly agree with that, brethren. And as Herbert Armstrong followed Christ, I follow his example exactly to, and I keep delivering at any point that I can Delivering the Ezekiel warning message to modern Israel. So we have the responsibility to tell the nations their sins, call them to repentance, and warn our nations about God's punishments to come if they don't repent. Now some who hear the message may heed. And many, of course, will not, brethren, but count on that. Those who hear and heed may be spared. And we understand that if the church does not do its part to warn the people, then the responsibility for that failure would rest on us. And I cannot emphasize enough that the importance of what I'm saying to you today, brethren. If we fail, the responsibility for the failure will rest on us. It cannot rest on unconverted people, those who have no clue, who, those who have no information. That is why I've put forth much effort in sending the warning to the modern house of Israel. <coughs> And I still feel, brethren, I haven't done enough, especially because I'm, in an, I'm an elder for Europe, you know. That's a humongous responsibility. I'm an elder for Europe, and there are descendants of Israel in the northwest part of this continent. For example, I mentioned France. My heart aches for France, the French people, and I, 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 I'm burning in desire to have this warning message, message sent to French people. But I don't speak French. And I cannot do all by myself. You know, I'm dying of desire to reach the French people, Danish people, Scandinavian people, the people of Iceland, the British Isles and Ireland, brethren, and the countries of Benelux with Ezekiel's match. I'm dying of desire. But how will I accomplish that? I don't know. Because in all those nations other than Britain and Ireland, there is no laborers to help in this endeavor. We have one member, as far as I know, two members in, in, on British Isles. One is sadly in hospital, our, our, our brother Vince. Uh, after having a, a stroke, he's in hospital. The other, the other person did contact me once and asked me possibly about services, attending services. Never, never, never came back to you know communicate with me. We do have one person in Ireland, by the way, my old acquaintance, but that's about it. We have this huge European continent, brethren, and I understand that without God's help, I cannot reach all those people. And we certainly, you know, shouldn't lose heart and we should pray for more laborers to be called by God. But again, do you understand what huge responsibility lies upon my shoulders? I cannot do it myself. I'm dying of desire to reach the Scandinavian people. But I don't speak any Scandinavian language. They do understand English, however. The Dutch people do understand English, however. They can be reached by English language. Yes, I agree. But the French people in particular cannot reach with the English language. I'm sure you know all of that. Because if there is one nation that is so proud of its heritage... It is France. And we need to reach them with French, but none of us speaks French here. But still, I'm not losing hope. Still, I'm hoping somehow God will find ways to get the message done, you know, across to the French people. It is interesting that the information that can be used to prove that the Bible 
is the word of God that is the 7,000 year plan of God and the prophecies and history that identify the English speaking people as the tribes of Joseph. It is also the same information needed to understand the responsibility to give a warning to Israel about the punishments to come. And you know, these two things, brethren, come hand in hand. It is as if the proof of God's word comes at a price. You know, it carries with it a responsibility to put that knowledge to good use. It cannot be rightly used just to selfishly help one's own self only. It has to be used in God's service to help others as well. In other words, as soon as God gives us the knowledge that the Bible is God's word, He also gives us a job to do, brethren. You know what is their job to do? Let me tell you. Warn Israel. Warn Israel. He gives the gift, and at the same time, he tells us how to use it. But also, with the responsibility, God gives the gift we need to be able to fulfill it. And without the knowledge of who Israel is, we would not know who to warn. And without the knowledge of the 7,000 year plan of God, we would not know when to warn. And we have, been, we have been given by God all those things to understand. Right? And Israel's Latish nations are declining in moral values in the meantime. At the same time, America and Britain are becoming weaker and they're, you know, they're losing, they're losing their dominance and their strength as compared with other nations. I mean, the whole world is now laughing at American presidential candidate because he lied to the, to the, to the people so outright, outrightly. I mean, so, so in, in such an amazing way, straightforwardly, he lied and, you know, all the world could see it, not only Americans. I was amazed. Never thought it would ever happen in my lifetime. Yes, we all know that the politicians all over the place they lie, but I mean this not only did he lie, but he but he but he challenges then his counterparts say, Well, if I said that, show it on your page. And sure enough, he's <laughs> sure enough the other candidate said, Yes, I will. And he did. As soon as the debate was over, there he comes on his page. There is uh, several recordings of the other candidate saying he was against fracking, you know, and he was he wants to stop fracking for all at all for all time and so on and so forth. Amazing times in which we are living, brethren. Amazing times that God has given. But you know, it's exciting as well. I want you always to be joyously excited, brethren, because God has given us in this most amazing time, in this end time, responsibility, possibility, privilege if you want, to Warn Israel. He has given us knowledge and has given us a job. Ezekiel's commission to warn Israel. You know, many don't see this. Many don't see how the America and Britain are, are, are declining in dominance and strength as compared with other nations. Many don't see this and perhaps they think that the United States will remain the strongest, richest, most powerful nation in the world for another hundred years or more. That's what many of my kinsmen here believe, brethren. And still others may see that Israelite nations will not remain dominant for very long. Few of my kinsmen do see that and they're not believers, but they send me messages saying, yeah, we can see that, you know, we can see that America is sinking. We can see that Britain is sinking. Yes. So they're paying attention. Yeah, we can see Germany rising to power. Germany all of a sudden. Yes, we can see that. And they're now amazed, you know, they're intrigued now by what we have to preach to them, brethren. So they may, you know, see that Israelite nations will not remain dominant for long, but they put their faith, however in a kind of collective world peace based on democracy and the enlightened good behavior of all nations on the earth. That is not going to happen. So the world has been at relative peace for the last 60 years, but it has been because of the economic and military strength of the United States and its allies as a force for peace, not the goodwill of all nations on earth. It is only fear, brethren. Only fear, nothing else. Only fear from the United States keeps them from going into war. And I can tell you from the Balkan, for the Balkan Peninsula, if there were no peacekeeping, so-called peacekeeping truth, because they haven't brought really peace at all, but if there were no international peacekeeping forces, let's call them that way, I think the warring factions in the Balkans would just go into war right away and try to kill one another. But the strength of the United States is now declining. The strength of Britain is declining now. And the strength of Germany is rising up, of course. And it will certainly, sooner or later, replace these peace, so-called peace missions around the world. Now, God taught ancient Israel to trust Him for their protection. As a nation today, the United States trusts in its military and in its allies for its protection, not God. 
As a nation, U.S. military obligations are far extended, yet recruitment is not providing the manpower in sufficient numbers for the military that American nation relies on. At the same time, their relationships with the, their allies are deteriorating. Can you see that? Especially now with President Trump being a man of principles. I do admire that man, nevertheless. And what he says, he mainly is very true. America has been misused and used by its allies you know germany has been using has been given so little and yet being mightily protected by the united states for example so what he's saying is true but that's why european allies hate america so much they hate him you wouldn't believe that serbia is one of the le one of the few very few if only country in europe that does support president current president trump because trump has never done anything wrong to this nation didn't bomb it didn't didn't impose any sanctions against it and so on other european nations especially the west europe those so-called allies they hate america and especially they hate president trump nevertheless he speaks the truth and but the fact is that because of that and his very principled stance the relationship between america and their allies are, is deteriorating as the american population ages you know also medical science and technology continue to provide more treatments but these treatments come at an ever increasing price and medical care is consuming a greater greater proportion of u.s earnings one of the biggest points of that debate was about health care you remember medicare obamacare and so on so the you know the uh, the debate continues about that at the same time there is a potential worldwide problem growing out of the convergence of two and possibly three trends you know one the world's economy is dependent on oil the one that you know the oil that is being exploited by fracking you know and uh, one of those candidates wants to stop fracking so some some of the states in the united states will basically <laughs> become bankrupt so on oil the world does depend on oil and there is only a limited amount of available oil on the earth and the world is approaching a point where it will be more and more difficult to find and extract more oil or frack do fracking if you wish now experts do not agree on how much oil is left but you know all agree it is limited and the supply is running down and there will come a time when it is no longer possible to extract the amount of oil this world's economy needs each year that's number one trend number two the rate of consumption of oil is rapidly increasing, not decreasing, it's increasing year by year. That puts the nations of this earth on a collision course with the inevitably re inevitable reality that a point will soon be reached when there is not enough oil to, the, to go around. At that point, the nations that control the oil will survive and the economies of the nations that cannot obtain the oil will collapse or be greatly reduced. There may be alternatives to oil, such as converting coal into oil or gasoline, but that is expensive and takes time to gear up, and sudden disruptions in the supply of oil can still hurt any nation's economy. And third, brethren, nuclear technology and the ability of nations to make nuclear weapons as well as the delivery vehicles to use them is spreading. That was the issue and is currently issue with Iran, you know. And while, you know, the world, the whole world, and especially the most powerful nation on earth, the United States is facing unprecedented problems and dangers, I think it should be apparent to those with a sense of the times we live in that there is a decline in the quality of leadership in the United States at every level of government and business. That's why that every level of government and business does hate the current president because he is, he is you know, messed up with their plans. He's not a politician, he's really a businessman. He, he has no aspirations to become rich through politics, as many other politicians do have aspirations in, our, in other countries, including our country. That's why we are just, our country is so impoverished because we are just, uh, we're just infested with, with corrupted politicians. America is currently very blessed to have a, a different kind of politician. Again, a man I greatly admire for various ways. I wish we had such a president here in this country. But nevertheless, the quality of leadership, as we have seen, if you have watched the latest debate, has completely become, you know, uh, 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 how shall I say, worthless. When a man who has been in the politics for 47 years blatantly lies, tells outright lie to the American public and the world public after all, 
just tells you in what kind of times we are living. That Something like that never, I think, would have never happened before. But it did happen, brethren, two nights ago. I watched it with my own eyes. And when he said, I never said that, I said, liar, I said. I've seen him, I, even I, who am not American, I've seen him say that. So the quality of leadership is going down. It is more and more difficult. I mean, look at the battle over the, over the Supreme Court. I'm so glad that that lady was elected into the Supreme Court. Of course, that she does deserve to be with her values. She deserves to be in the Supreme Court. But look how much opposition was there. And the opposition coming from who? From the second. Because in your, in your country, in America, you have two parties, you know. In other countries, you have tens of thousands of parties. In, in Italy, you have the government at one point would be, <laughs> the government would resign like every six months, you know. In America, that's not the case. You have a stable government, you know, ruled by one party, ran by one party, and it stays for four years. So that one party opposes, you know, opposes who? It opposes a lady who is very conservative, very good, a lady of very good values. And even worse, who is the head of those parties? The outstanding personalities are Catholics, declared Catholics. Can you believe that they're declared Catholics and yet they advocate abortion? I mean, what kind of what kind of character is that? What kind of integrity is that, brethren? It is more and more difficult to find examples of the kind of integrity, strong competence, diligence, and effectiveness needed to solve problems and get jobs done among those in leadership positions. The response to Hurricane Katrina is one example. You know, American leaders are making, they were making too many mistakes and are not working effectively and cooperatively with each other. That's why you had all these burnings. And I mean, they, they wouldn't call the federal government in to solve these and resolve problems on the streets of America. So the, the, the streets would just get burning and all these thugs were doing all kinds of horrible things that... And the whole world watches that reading. And the whole world was able to see two nights ago a presidential candidate lying. And it wasn't the only lie he said, by the way. And every time the debate would go to ask him about his son Hunter and uh, the role of his son Hunter, he would blame Russia. It's Russian plot. You know, it's Russia. Well, Russia. Well, Russia doesn't have the hard disk of Hunter Biden. The decline in moral values, in family stability, in respect for authority, in discipline, in basic honesty is all taking a toll. Brother. It may be that what is prophesied in Isaiah chapter 3, verse 1 through 4, where God says he will take away the mighty man, the honorable man, and the counselor is being fulfilled today. At the same time, our internal, you know, divisions in every nation, including your Israelite nations, you know, they hinder efforts to solve uh, your problems. America, America is not united as a nation. You know, America was mostly united during World War II, but since then, America has become one of the most divided nations on earth. And Jesus Christ said that a house divided cannot stand. You remember Luke chapter 11, verse 17. The Americans are divided, Democrat versus Republican, liberal versus conservative, rich versus poor, religious versus secular, and by race. And that's exactly what I've been telling my people every time they ask me about America. I said, it is a racially divided country. For years I've been telling it, my people, and now this year we see how racially divided this country, your country is. The predominance of negative campaign ads shows, I mean, those horrible campaign ads uh, directed toward the current president, unbelievable, incredible. I mean, speaking of integrity, uh, the, 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 the Speaker of the House caught without wearing a mask and saying that it was a plot, that it was set up by the Salon, salon Beauty you know, owner. Amazing. Destroyed. She destroyed the business of a small, you know, small business. And she's not even, she, nobody takes her to court. Nobody, she doesn't give any compensation to that poor lady she's the, the poor own you know the, the, the Sloan beauty owner said I have to leave San Francisco I have to move out of here because I can no longer survive here the depths of of corruption and horror in 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 Israel it's it, it I mean something like that was unimaginable 20 30 50 years ago you know the predominance of negative campaign ads you know have also divided you know how divided you know Americans have become political politi Politicians prefer to belittle and attack their opponents rather than propose solutions to, to your problems. We have seen that two nights ago. 
And who is the, doing the attacking all the time? It's the other president. You know, the, the current president is complete, constantly being attacked with all kinds of lies and horrors. All kinds of lies that heap up upon him, against him, trying to... And then they also, you know, they speak about... They, they try to woo the, 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 the blacks and the Latinos to, you know, to vote for them and speaking things which are just... I mean, he wants to give... Ill, Citizenship, Biden, to 11 million people, to 11 million people. You know, American society is only infested with so many problems. He wants to give right away citizenship to 11 million more people. My word. Incredible. Well, he's lying, of course. Do you think that he would deliver his problem? Of course he wouldn't. He could have done it many times ago. He built those cages on the, on the, on, uh, on the borders and stuff like that. But that shows to you and to me and to all of us what has become of the American society. So at a time when, you know, when America and Britain and other Israelite nations are about to face their greatest dangers and challenges, you know, those nations seem to be equipped with less and less wisdom and skill to deal with them. And that is a very dangerous combination. The United States are still, you know, the richest, most powerful nation on earth, but Americans are living off of the sacrifices and accomplishments of generations past who paid the price to build that country and I don't think today's generations is the same sort that cannot be any, however last indefinitely keep that in mind so the time the clock is ticking the time is running out God has blessed America far more than Americans ever deserved but they have not sufficiently appreciated what God has done for them nor have they obeyed and acknowledged the God who blessed them and now God is taking their blessings away now the Ezekiel warning in closing brethren is twofold Firstly, it is a warning message for our time today to the modern descendants of the House of Israel, especially the United States, Britain and Canada, and also a warning to the Jews. But secondly, it is a warning to the Church of God that they better deliver the warning to Israel. Notice, and the Church of God, when I said I mean in a broader sense, but you know that the other churches of God, they are shunning away from preaching the prophecies, brethren, they don't preach the prophecies anymore, or not as strongly as they should be. It's only the continued Church of God that has been strongly sending warnings, citing the Bible, quoting the Bible, telling Israel their sins and the results and consequences of that. Notice that in Ezekiel 33 verses 1 through 6, Ezekiel is told to tell the people about the watchman's responsibility. In other words, the warning about the responsibility of the watchman to warn is not just for Ezekiel, it is also for the people. The warning about the responsibility to warn is as much a part of the Ezekiel warning as the warning to repent of our sins. So you can see that also in Isaiah 58 when it says, you know, blow the trumpet and tell my people, raise voice like a trumpet, tell my people their sins. The church of God let me be more specific, the continuing Church of God, plus those who learn the truth from the Church of God, continuing Church of God and from the Bible, have that responsibility today. Brethren, this is the meaning of the Ezekiel warning.